Okay, so I'm gonna go show you the macro expand function, which I looked up because I had forgotten the details of it. Um, so if you define foo with f but without the dollar sign on the one inside the quote block, then you can, so you can do at two, and obviously it's, well, if I make it at print line of whatever, it's much easier to type now that I can see the screen. <laughs> All right, so obviously it doesn't call our expression, but if we use the macro expand function, so macro expand is a function and not a macro, which means that you have to stick your um, thing inside of a quote block. So you call a macro on something inside the quote block, and then macro expand will, sh will print out, will, show, will give you the um, result of that. So in this case, we know that, so we gave it two, but two doesn't get filled in here, it's still just F. Whereas if I define it with the dollar sign, now it has two right there. This can be really useful for debugging macros because you can go, oh, I see what's going wrong. Like I can see exactly what the output of a macro is. All right, so for the break, um, they said we should find, so this is how you benchmark something. And then we wanted to do a macro so that I could call at bench of sleep 0 0.1. And it would do the same thing as if I had typed that whole line above that. So could I have a show of hands? Raise your hand if you attempted this and have some idea what we should put in the macro. Okay. All right, who, who attempted it and got stuck? Okay, so at least those the same group that attempted it. All right, so who knows what the first line of the macro should be? So this is, so we just defined foo, so this should be pretty, pretty similar, right? We want a macro called bench. So who wants to tell me what the first line of our macro should be? And we could use F or E or whatever variable name you want there. It doesn't matter. Okay, I'll give you this one. Quote. So what goes inside of the macro? The other one of you in the back who said that they knew what they were doing. Yeah. Is everyone happy with this? All right. So now we can call at bench of sleep 0.1. It paused for a second, which is good since that's a sign that it was working and it gave us back a number that looks about right. All right. So good job on that. All right, so I'm gonna show you something a little bit more fancy. So we're going to do a few new features here, actually. So I'm going to do bench two, it's the second version of bench, and I'm going to do args dot, dot, dot. So this is special syntax for doing variable arguments. Args will be an array in this case, that we're a tuple, I mean. It will be a tuple that holds all of the arguments to this function. If I wanted to, I could do f comma args instead, and then I would get the first argument and then zero or more other arguments will be in a tuple. So in this case, all I'm going to do is call bench2 without a, with notice that this is without an at sign, so this is just a function. And I'm going to give it args and dot, dot, dot again. Here, the dot, dot, dot splats out that tuple so bench just gets its arguments normally instead of getting one argument, which is a tuple of this macro's arguments. So this looks a little bit silly, right? I'm just like calling a function from my macro. So now I'm going to make my function bench two. 
So bench two might take just like an expression. Um, and then I'm going to steal what we wrote earlier. Um, okay, so here I need to change F to E. And so this function does the same thing that our macro did, right? So now we have at bench sleep, and then at bench two should do exactly the same thing. I'm just using a function as the body of my macro. And so the number is a little bit different, but it's about the same. Okay, so now what's the point of calling a function from your macro? In this case, it means that we can use more of the power of generic functions. So in the, I'm going to have E, and then I'm also going to have N. And so instead of 10 here, I'm going to put in N. And now bench two has two methods. And so bench two of sleep is going to work exactly the same way. But now if I put in two here, the number might be a little bit more inexact. It might take, and it's also gonna take less time. If I put in say, I don't know, 30 here, it's going to take longer. It's gonna take more like three seconds to get that number back. And if I put in 300, I'm probably going to control C this before it finishes its thing because it's going to take a full 30 seconds to run. Um, and so the power of uh, using function, so macros don't have the same multiple dispatch capabilities that generic functions have. Um, this might change in the future, but at the moment you, get, you don't get to have multiple methods for your macros, which means that if you want to have your macro have multiple methods, the easiest thing to do is to have it call a function and then use that f function's multiple dispatch to really de to define, to have like all that first class power of multiple dispatch to define macro methods. Usually, also, usually when you are defining macros, you, it's r relatively rare to use macros inside macros. Like it can be a little bit strange once you start like, when your macros start calling other macros. In this case, elapsed isn't a big deal, but for the most part, you want to like, try to own, like not nest your macros too much because it can get kind of confusing. All right, so we've talked about macros. We've tried writing one. Um, there's, I, there, macros, usually, usually you don't want to use a macro. It's relatively uncommon to write macros. Like, it's just like, this is like a very powerful tool, but not one that you use frequently. Um, there's like some parts where you just can't use a function because you need to not evaluate things or, or you want to do something like, you just like don't, there's some reason not to use a function or that you can't use a function, and then you use a macro. But by default, the macro should not be like the first thing you try or the first, like the first idea that comes to mind in most cases. Um, there is one part, part of, of one of where, I think there's a, there's one thing that was really cool that I saw in Julia where they use a macro to make code more efficient. There's like relatively rare to like get, like macros usually make things nicer in some way, but faster. Um, there's a, there is a particular algorithm, there's like a mathematical thing I'm sorry that I'm forgetting the name, but they have, it's this thing that involves a bunch of constants. You take this polynomial and you use all these constants and you like get this answer out of it. Um, and usually when you implement that, you make like, like it has this, these like six different giant big constants. So you don't want to type them out all over the place. So like you make a lookup table of them, you make an array and then you like look them up when you need them. Um, but in Julia, you can use a macro to do at whatever the name of this process was, and then it'll stick in the constants for you. And you, since macros um, run at compile time, like they run before you've evaluated most of the code, then you can, so you've in, then you can insert this code and it's just like as if you had typed those constants right in there, which means that when LLVM as part of the JIT process um, runs on your code, it will go, oh, these are immediate values. These are just literals. I can just stick them right into the, like as immediate values in, uh, my output, which means that the Julia version of this thing was faster than the versions in MATLAB or like SciPy, both of which were just calling C libraries. 
So like having immediates there, let the Julia, the Julia code be faster than using a lookup table in C is the assumption of why, why we were faster. But so one of the things you can do if you're interested in looking at um, the output of your code, so if we have, let's see, let me see if sort is interesting. So, so what we're gonna do is look at some of these functions for Sorry. Uh, what we're going to do is look at some of the like functions for introspection. So I just wanted to show you a couple more of them. They can be useful if you like if you care about what uh, seeing what the compiler is doing internally to your code. So the first one we should look at is code uh, lowered. So I'm giving it I'm giving it a little bit longer function than just plus. So this is sort on an array that has ints of, and is of dimension one. Um, so code lower is the first level of code you can see using these functions. You give it a generic function and you give it a signature. And then it will give you a, an array of expert objects. And so these experts are, right, are just one step away from the code that you type in. So they're like, they, they like simplify out some um, constructions, like they might turn for loops into, into go-tos instead so that all the loops look the same, and then they like just like one one like level of desugaring, and then beyond that, we get into code typed, and like another level more lowering. You've got type, everything has types on them because they're type inferred. Um, there's also been like some optimizations run on it, so it might be more rearranged than just lowered. After that, you have code LLVM. And so this is the first one that isn't going to give you back expert objects. This, notice the change in the font here, the, like the font color here. The code LLVM prints out, as like to standard out, prints out the LLVM bytecode. So this is, this is not Julia. This is the LLVM, what Julia is sending to the LLVM compiler. So this is LLVM bytecode. Um, it probably looks unfamiliar. It's like similar to like you might like it's similar to assembly, but it's higher level because it's to LLVM, so it's not to a specific machine. And then we can look at the output of what L the LLVM's JIT compiler did. So this is going to be native assembly for my machine in particular. Ooh, that's exciting. Um, I'm going to switch to a new terminal so I can submit a bug report later. And see if I can get that to work again. Um, Anyway, so if code native worked there, then we would have gotten um, the native assembly for my machine. Um, Save mutations faults are very rare, and they're getting rare. I only occasionally find them. Um, and they're always worth reporting so that we can fix them. All right, so. All right, so those were some introspection things. They're occasionally useful, so like, if you want to know for certain whether two syntaxes are the same, you can look at code lowered of like functions written in two different ways. So if you make foo and foo2, and you try out two different syntaxes, you can make sure that they're like exactly the same because once they're lowered, they'll evaluate, they'll be exactly the same in code lowered. Um, so it gives you some power to like see what the compiler is thinking. All right. Um, so we have about like a little over an hour left. Um, I have, so there's two, two things I want to get to. One of them is packages because that'll probably be very important to your usage of Julia and like talking a little bit about a package system. And I'm also gonna try to do an example that involves reading and writing from files, um, a little bit of TCP sockets and networking and a little bit of some like basic regex stuff just so you can see how that stuff is done in Julia, which should be very similar to other programming language like Python or something, but just to like show show off some of our APIs. Um, so first, so there's this module called package, and pa PKG. So this is our package system. If you're familiar with like Linux or something, we have packages like that, or like any other programming languages, like set of libraries. So it just makes it easy for you to get libraries, and this comes with the Julia installation. So you'll all have this. 
Um, and so there's some functions in package. So in any mod, so package is a module. If you type in the name of a module and then put dot, then you'll be able to see all, of, when you press tab, you'll get all of the, all the tab completions, which means all of the functions that are in there. In this case, like not all of these are actually relevant to us. So the ones with capital names are either types or modules because that's the naming convention in Julia. Uh, so let's see, so package.status is often useful. So this is going to tell me all of the packages I have installed and their version numbers and whether I have them, whether like I have them special to me or whether they're, um, so this is, so this means that I've added this package, like from the Julia repo, I've done package.add arg parse. And so it has to be there. The other ones are ones that are installed as dependencies or ones that I have on master. So like I originally installed some of these, I think through package.add or um, all the ones you install through package.add should show up here. And then these are other ones that I've installed in other ways. So the thing here says master, that means that I have the latest um, copy of this source code. The plus here means that, th that I'm ahead of the version that's registered with the package manager. So my code is newer than what you would get if you do package.add. Um, for the most part, you will be unlikely to do that, but so um, if I do package.add, let's say small package. Um, well, let's see what's available. Package.available should tell us all of the packages I could possibly use. Um, I noticed the vertical dot, dot, dot here. When Julia prints out large arrays, like mar large matrices, it will not print everything out. It'll only print out like, you know, some of the beginning and some of the ends, so you can see what's there, and it will abbreviate it with dot, 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 just like a math textbook would. And we, we have vertical and diagonal and horizontal dot, dot, dots, so it like really looks like a math textbook. Um, all right, so I could do package dot add ASCII plots. And so I put this in quotes, so this is a string. These functions take strings as arguments. I can't just use the symbol, like I can't just type in ASCII plots. That would, so Julia would interpret that as like a variable name or a reference to something as like a symbol. Um, but it wouldn't be a valid symbol yet because I haven't installed it. All right, so notice that our package manager is like based on Git, so all, every package is going to be a Git repository. Um, which is a kind of version control software. This means that all of our packages can be hosted on GitHub. Um, it also makes means that you can do some neat stuff with like cloning the source code easily and that kind of thing. Um, so what it's telling me is it clone, cloned ASCII pots from the URL registered in the package manager. It's telling what, what version it's installing and it told me that it also updated my require file. So I'm gonna show you something else. So this is, so the way, I was just gonna tell you a little bit more about how like packages work. So in your home directory, you'll have, after you've started using the package manager, there's a function for that package that init. So this is the function you'll call first before you use the package manager. Um, and so it's telling me it's already initialized so it doesn't do anything, but it would create that, that folder for you and create like there's a metadata directory inside where packages are registered. And so there's a folder for each of my installed packages. And then I have a require file which lists all of the packages that I want to keep installed that I've told the package manager, these packages are required, I have to keep them. Um, and so right now it just has these two and if I added a new requirement, so let's see what was available. Let's see, let me pick something else so it should be small. So, uh, let's try, uh, do I have WebSockets already? No, let's install WebSockets, that's just pure Julia. So if I edit require, and I just add a new line that says, WebSockets and save the file. And then in Julia, I should do package.status. Um, and I believe calling anything, let's see, 
Ooh. Apparently, I didn't need to. so package dot. I need to call something else first. So package dot resolve, I believe. So after you edit the require file, you should call package dot resolve. Um, it will also be called after a lot of so package dot add add something to your require file and then calls package dot resolve. So that's why it's usually handier to use the functions from the REPL. But if you want to be able to just edit your require file, you can do that, and then you just call package.resolve afterwards. And it will download the packages, download all of their um, dependencies, um, do all of that kind of stuff. And if you, so since they're Git repositories, if you clone them yourself into your .julia repository, so if you clone them into your .julia directory, and then you run package.resolve, it will respect the require file inside the package. So in this case, um, so it, it installed some new stuff for me. So if I go into WebSockets, it also has a require file. Um, and so this tells me which other packages depends on and what versions. And so if you clone a Git repository that's set up as a Julia package, even if it's not registered, you'll be able to call package.resolve and it will respect the require file in that repository and will download all of the requirements you say you need. Um, which means that you can, it makes it easier to develop packages because you don't have to publish them to the like official um, repository of packages before you're ready, but you'll still be able to track them using package. Uh, so, and so we can do pkg. You can use pkg.clone to do that yourself. Like if you do clone and you give it a URL, it will clone, clone that repository and then call package.resolve for you. Um, you can do package.checkout if you want to be on master. So let me look at my status again. Um, so I'll probably, I can check out like say ASCII plots or something. So if I, so right now, if we look at ASCII plots, it says 0 .0 0.0.1 and it doesn't say master. So if I do package.checkout ASCII plots, it says it's checking out the master. I'll probably download a little bit of stuff. Okay, so I tried. To, so the second line is from Resolve. It's saying, "Nope, I didn't need to do anything." And so package.status is going to tell me that. So now I get the like plus master. And so if I want to give that back, so right now it's pinned to master. So the package manager isn't going to mess with this. It's not going to do, take me to other versions. It's going to leave that one alone. Um, if I want to release that again, so package.release ASCII plots, this is going to say, okay, package manager, I trust you. I don't need to have this on a specific version anymore. You can do your thing. Um, and this means that now package.status is going to reflect that. So now I don't have the plus, I don't have the master. It's going, okay, you're just at the current, ver you're just at version 0.0.1. Um, so those are the basics of using the package manager. If you want to release your own package, you should look at the section in the manual on the packaging, um, packaging, and it will have some. It'll tell you about some of the other functions that I didn't just cover. Um, but those are most of the ones you should be using as as a user. You can also use package. So you can also use package.rm um, to remove something. So I can remove ASCII string ASCII. And this is going to remove ASCII plots and anything that I installed just because of ASCII plots. In this case, there wasn't anything. Um, but it's deleted that, and it's, so you'll see multiple things have disappeared from um, my .julia. So I no longer have ASCII plots. And if I look in my require file, there's no longer an ASCII plots in there. Uh, and so one, the way that packages are published are by putting them into metadata. So metadata is a repository on GitHub, and it's also something that's in your uh, .julia directory. And so this lists all of the available packages, their versions, and the, uh, the URL to get the package from, and the SHA ones, the particular um, commits at which, e which each version is tagged at. And so you get, and so when you, you get a, if you want to, when you publish your package, you're, 
you just make a pull request to this repository, to the metadata.jl repository on GitHub, to tell it, this is my package, I'm gonna create a folder for it, and Julia will be able to do all that for you using some of the other functions. Um, all right, so I don't have any, pa any questions about the package manager. All right, so the package manager will also, it's also, it's also possible for, for it to install binary dependencies for you once the, like, the person who wrote the package has set it up correctly. Um, we have stuff for, for doing binary dependencies, uh, which is useful if you're like wrapping a C library and then you need to like just give them the like library, the dynamic library file so that they can actually call it from Julia. All right, so we talked about the package manager. I'm going to do a quick example about using, um, using files and using networking. So, um, Julia, so if you want to, so I'll need, I'll need to set up some files. Let's uh, move to, let's see. All right. Uh, All right, so I've made a new directory to put some files in. I should also, um, So, uh, all right. All right, so I have Julia in the same folder, so I'm going to make some files. So, let's make, uh, I'm going to use my favorite Unicode character to show you that Julia can do Unicode just fine. And so can the Linux terminal. So this is my snowman file. Okay. And a normal file. Um, and we can also do files that have white space in their name, um, which I'll create from Julia to show you a little bit about the So now from Julia, I can do, so semicolon will let me run shell commands directly, so I can just do semicolon ls, and so this is showing me what's in the current folder. So this, um, this by the way, did not involve the shell. So even though I'm typing in a shell command, this is going to be parsed by Julia. Um, this is important, so I'm gonna show you the command. I'm gonna talk about uh, calling some shell commands first, then we're gonna talk about uh, working with files. Then we're gonna talk about some TCP, TCP sockets. And I'll show you how to use, do, the, do the first version of a networked grep thing. And then we'll do some stuff with regexes and do the pure Julia implementation. Um, so first uh, we can, let's see. So I can make using backtick. So this will be on the upper left of your keyboard under a tilde. Um, this is the, so this is a backtick. This is a single quote, this is a double quote. Each of them are different. So back quotes will get you a command. So like echo hi, that's a command object. Single quotes will give you a character, a char. So like this isn't going to work. 
It's an invalid character literal. You have to use double quotes and then you'll get a string. Um, so, okay, so back to the command thing. So type of echo hi. So this gives you a command object, CMD. Um, and so when you have this, there's some things you can do with it. So methods with, so these are methods where one of their arguments is a command. So it doesn't look like you can do much, right? Like methods with didn't give us very many results. Um, however, if there's some more like methods of methods with. So if I give it command and then I use one of these later ones, so this is saying that, so IO is gonna be an implicit argument here. So this IO is the IO that it's printing to and most of the standard one, okay, sorry, I should look at this one. Okay, so we give it some T that's a type, in this case we're giving it commands, and then if I give it a bool, I can tell it whether to show parents. So that means that whether I want methods for parents of this type. So in this case, if I take super of commands, so commands parent type is abstract command. So if I do methods with command true, I will also get things for abstract command. Which in this case is exactly what we want because now we can see all of the things we can do with a command. So we can have, we have a pipe operator, we have some redirection operators, um, we have read all, uh, run, writes to, reads from each line. So all of the, and success. All of these are very useful things. So I'm gonna start with, so if I run echo hi, you see that this printed out in gray, so it just ran the command for me. I don't get any output. If, however, it failed, I would have gotten an error. So in Julia, if your command fails when you run it, you will get a Julia error because the return, the return value isn't success. You can also get that as you, by using success echo high. So this will re won't get won't re will return will not give you an error. It'll return a boolean, so that is, which might be easier for your code to handle for whatever reason. Neither of these did you get the return like the output of the command. All you got was you know either like a boolean or an error or nothing. So I want the output of this command. So we can get use read all. And so this got as a string literal that includes the new line at the end. So everything that got written to standard out by this command. So this doesn't return until after the command returns. It waits until the command is all done and then it gives you this whole the string of the entire output. Um, so you can also use, there's uh, some useful methods. So you can use read and write, uh, reads, writes to and reads from. So read and write. reads from, and I'll do writes to in a moment. So the help functions for these are pretty useful. You give them, each of them just takes a command and the help function tells you what to do. So this is, this like set, starts it running asynchronously like as another process and gives you the, the standard in the standard out and the thing that's running. Um, and that lets you interact with, thing, with it um, using both the input and the output so you can just talk to it arbitrarily. Um, reads from gives you back the stream reading from the process so you'll be able to get it standard out. Um, writes to is a stream that lets you talk to a process but doesn't give, you don't know what the process is printing out but you can write to its input. Um, and so in this case, if we wanted to use grep, we could run uh, grep star rocket. Um, and now you can see we get a Julia error when grep failed because I used the wrong syntax. Hmm. Oops. 
What am I doing? Um, oh, right. So I should interpolate. Um, let's see. Hold on. Let me. I, I forgot the syntax for this, too. Okay. So read dear is a function that will give us a list of strings, which is the files in the current directory. Um, so instead of using star, because um, Julia isn't, so, Jul so Julia is parsing our command, not, not the shell, which means we can't just use asterisk, because Julia isn't use it, doesn't use that in this way. Um, so I interpolate again, again with the dollar sign symbol, just like quote blocks, just like strings. Um, in this case, since this isn't a variable, um, I need to use parens, otherwise it would try to interpolate read dear the function in there. Um, so I want to use parens around it so that I can call the function. And this, I think, should work. Okay, so this says, okay, I grepped all the files, the file normal has the string, has a line containing rocket. Okay, so that gives us, so now we can get, now we can run it. Um, if we wanted to get the output, we could use read all, and then we get a string. Um, so that's how you, so that's a little bit about the interacting with um, commands. The only other thing I wanna show you is to point out that when I interpolated read dear into the command, so here, Notice how like snowman and normal, like they appeared as, as lists would appear when you put them into a command, like if you were typing them into the shell. Um, so if I, let's see. What if I run echo hi to a file called space? Oops. Okay, so that should still have worked anyway. So you'll notice that there's this first line here. This is my file that's named space. Um, and so I can use better syntax. So we we decided to change operators for this because greater than it has a, has a different meaning than um, the way we're using it here. So instead we're using a pipe greater than, which you can also, I believe, use with functions. So I can also put a new line in here. And uh, the shell prints that as a question mark, but it's actually like a new line. Um, okay, so both of those will just contain high. So if I grep, so if I look at this, so notice we've started using um, quotes. So it's using single quotes to escape the space and the new line for, for the shell um, in order to be able to grep over all of them. So now if I grep for hi, it's giving me back the output of grep, um, which might be more readable as from. And so this, this blank line is because the name of the file is new line. All right, so um, so this is something that Julia is doing special for you. So it understands that each thing in read dear in this list of strings should be one entity when it runs the shell command, which is why it's doing all of the escaping for you. This can be really handy if you're like, if you have a list of files and maybe like the user input some of these files, when you put them into, when you do it this way through Julia, you know that each of the, those files, like no matter what white space they contain, no matter what they might have in them, they will not show up to the shell as commands, they will show up to the shell as, you know, strings and will be escaped accordingly. <laughs>